So really excited today to have uh, with me Oz Zafar, who's the DVP from TD. Thanks for joining us, Oz. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here uh, to speak to Portage and, and your client. Yeah, I mean, I always find these, these conversations really interesting because so much changes um, so, so quickly, especially with the pandemic. And um, I think that a lot of people are going to see some consistent themes, um, you know, things Things have changed, but there is still kind of a new normal emerging. So I, I think it's gonna be really helpful for people to see where the bank's head is at and, and what things look like from a buyer's perspective and seller's perspective. Um, so as most people know, um, I'm the, the founder and president of Portage and we operate in Southwestern Ontario. Um, specializing in transactions, a million to 30 million. And we align really nicely with, with Oz and his team. They do a lot of the funding in this space um, and they're really good at what they do. And I'll, I'll let Oz speak kind of to his role and to what they do as well. Yeah, thanks, Jim. So I am, uh, as Jim mentioned, the district vice president for TD Commercial Banking. I cover Halton region, uh, but I work very closely with the Hamilton office as well. That's why we have the big overlap uh, and work closely with, with Jim and the Portage team, uh, all of the Golden Horseshoe and then and then Halton region, uh, Burlington, Oakville, Milton, Halton Hills, so GTA West, that whole area. We are we cover the mid market, so this uh, this would be any clients that kind of outgrow small business all the way up to the national, the, the syndicated deals, national accounts, uh, the really large large files. So a big a big space and general industry. So we cover all all areas uh, and have all types of all types of clients. Right on. And so we were talking so this, about. Sorry, I, I was just yeah. going to say we, we were talking about this new normal. So, yeah, interested in hearing a little bit about what this means from your perspective. Mm -hmm. So, as you touched on earlier, Jim, there is it, things are, are still a bit uncertain and they keep changing. So, there is, I don't even know, and that's why the new normal is even in quotes, because I, I don't even know if anybody can define that. And they, and they do keep changing, but we are uh, seem to be getting the cases under control and restrictions seem to be easing at a lot of places. So I think we're finding more and more, more and more people returning to office offices and businesses and having in-person meetings. Uh, so there is, um, there, there's more activity and, and that's what we're going to talk about what the land, the lending landscape looks like in this new normal. So, the, our topic, our discussion today, I'll touch on how the impact of the pandemic on, uh, you know, it's been over a year. So now when we're looking at, we're looking backwards at what that initial impact was on a lot of our clients and the companies and lending landscape looking forward and to some tips and strategies for, uh, for our, our listeners today. Perfect. So let's jump into it. I mean, I, I think people have have seen this five letter word so many times as COVID. Um, like have things changed a lot in the last 20 plus months from your perspective? It, it's funny, Jim, in, in some ways they, they have changed so much and in other ways, not at all. So when, when I mentioned we're, we're looking at, now we're getting, we're just finishing all the reviews where we're seeing the impact of, uh, of COVID on a lot of businesses. And, and some have had the material impact, of course, uh, but many of them, it, it hasn't been as, as hard or it's been the opposite. It's been fantastic in, in a bunch of industries. Uh, our restructuring group um, is still at pre-pandemic level, level. So what that means is there's still a lot of capital out there. We had, there's a lot of government funding and, and stimulus that was, uh, that was in play. Uh, operating line usage still remains at very low levels. Across the, across the commercial bank, not just TD, but you see it, the banks all release their earnings. There's a lot of capital on the bank's balance sheet. And, and you saw that on the last, the last quarter when all the banks, because we provisioned heavy 
expecting losses and they never came. So we took mm-hmm. all those provisions back and they went to the bottom line. So uh, other certain banks are, are making strategic moves to, to put that capital in play. So TD, for example, completed the Wells Fargo acquisition on the equipment finance side earlier this year. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's another large acquisition that comes up in the US. So it's either if you're sitting on the capital, either you're lending it out or you're or doing some sort of strategic move. Now, how that ties into very similarly, it, that ties in and relates to our customers as well. There's a lot of companies sitting on a lot of cash because that's the cash that we have. So we're seeing uh, a lot of M&A activity and, and Jim, we've talked about it and that's come down market quite a bit. It used to be the senior, the senior lenders would only look at uh, the larger cash flow deals, maybe 5 million needs uh, where we could say there's EV, there's enterprise value to the company and a stable cash flow. That's come down, down market quite a bit. Uh, and now we're looking at deals. We've been looking at deals that are only, you know, maybe one or 2 million in, in EBITDA. Uh, so the banks are open for business. They have been that pause, that pause during the pandemic was maybe a quarter, not even a full quarter where, where the banks paused to make sure we checked on all our existing portfolio, existing customers made sure we helped them as much as we could deferring loan loan payments and, um, uh, and assisting them in, in, in any way we could. And now, now looking backwards, if we're getting all those interviews, those statements with the COVID impact, the analysis has changed. So we there is obviously an impact to credit ratings and their cash flow. Uh, a lot of our, this will be no surprise, you're hearing it a lot right now, is supplier relationships. Very, uh, very tough to get certain parts. You see it in the auto industry, you see it in, in almost any industry where it's, it's hard to get, uh, to get supply, to get certain parts or supplies and, and that's impacting pricing, that's impacting revenue, that's impacting uh, turnaround time. And we're seeing that obviously impact some of our clients and, uh, and, and we have to build around that. So if it's operating line usage, building in more leniency, because you might have your receivables are, are aged longer than they would be because it's taking longer to complete jobs. Obviously, your your payables are a bit stretched as well. So, so just leniency around uh, our how we're assessing the situation, knowing that this is not unique. This is unique and not uh, something that we have dealt with in the past. Right, and you talk, touched on a really interesting point, and, and I I don't think all and correct me if I'm wrong. Chartered banks are in the same. Um, territory in that when the pandemic hit, I think some folks retreated from the lower mid market. So for some of the smaller deals, like the 2 million enterprise value and up, we found, you know, things relatively challenging, even pre pandemic, Um, even if it cash flowed, even if it was a good business. um, Our greatest fear, a buyer's fear and a seller's fear is that you know, there's no bank to actually fund these deals. And if that goes away, um, it it makes it really difficult to sell a business. Because I mean, as you as you know, usually if there's a 20 percent buyer investment and a a 20 percent VTB, if the bank can come to the table and fund fund 60 percent, it makes for a really good um, transaction. But um, what we've seen is you know, we were really nervous too when the pandemic hit because we knew that there are people who wanted to sell and buy, but if the financing isn't there, what's going to happen? But can can you talk a little bit about TD's approach? Because it sounds, if I I heard you correctly, you guys actually moved down market a bit. Mm -hmm. So the approach, you know, as you know, our approach is still very local, Jim. So we control the entire process in-house. I run the Halton office. We've got, uh, I've got my manager of credit who adjudicates the files in-house as well, as well as the sales team and the support team. So every deal we do when we're running the analysis and putting the term sheet together and writing up the deal, it's all internal uh, with under my team. So that keeps us closer to the clients, closer to the business, closer to the deal and, and allows us to have a good understanding of any cash flow, normalizations, challenges that the business is, is going through. Uh, the lend 
lenders in general, there was, as I mentioned, there was a slight pause and then the multiples seemed to bounce right back. And, and that's primarily because of the level of capital that was out there. There's a lot of cash. So on the smaller end, we, we do still require a good amount of equity. And even if it is a, a VTB, it would have to be fully subordinated and postponed to us uh, to treat it as equity. But we'll come to the table on, you know, maybe it's a five-year, five-year loan, and and we'd have to be, we'd have to be, on the on the smaller end, there are normally there are usually more normalizations, so we have to get comfortable with the normalized EBITDA. But if we can, if we understand the story and can make an argument that it's um, that it's stable and that and that it 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 is either stable or improving we could get our heads around um, a deal on the smaller end. Oh, that's good to hear. And it sounds like you guys kind of look at things from a case by case basis and um, you're not using one brush to paint five different industries, five different companies. It's kind of looking at each opportunity separately. Yeah. Cause even in the market right now, when you look at multiples, there's no, there's, there doesn't seem to be a pattern. Right. There's certain companies, it's, everything seems to be case by case. Certain companies are, are selling for much higher multiples than others in the same exact industry and maybe not even too different in terms of size. So uh, it, it really is coming down to uh, each, each looking at each company in isolation and, and their, their relationships, their customers, their suppliers, and how all those are, are maintaining. Right. So let's talk a little bit more about the landscape, the lending landscape. I think a lot of buyers and and even business owners are really curious about, you know, what's taken place since COVID and how you guys are dealing with some of the some of the difficulties out there. Right. So the landscape uh, hasn't changed materially. So as I mentioned, you know, in the last bullet point on here is cash flow loans. We are seeing more of those. More, there's a, a quite a bit of more M and A activity because there's so much cash out in the market. But aside from that, you look at real estate, commercial mortgages. The arguably the you know commercial real estate market was for a while was just as hot as the residential real estate market. We had customers sitting on the sidelines with cash, couldn't find properties. So mm-hmm. those those are trading at pretty good multiples. Uh, we, we're still doing operating lines, as I said, though, working capital financing operating lines because of the cash balances are still at a low, low utilization. Uh, equipment loans, there's big, quite a bit on the equipment financing side. And as I mentioned, because of that, we acquired Wells Fargo to boost our book. And, and with the Wells Fargo acquisition, we're now covering everything on the small end too. So we're covering all the small business, small business type com- equipment loans all the way up to the, to the mid market. So uh there's there's a lot of demand for large equipment purchases large we we just did a large municipal um, large construction project so equipment for that for municipal projects so there there's a lot of activity out there uh mortgages are still you know 25 years interest rates are low so people are locking in long term long term rates and uh on these properties and then we've also the real estate secured line of credit. That's a newer product that we've we've introduced that seems to be uh, in the last few years has really picked up interest. And that is an operating line secured by the real estate. So that would be if you've got a free and clear asset and you want to have quick access to capital to either close on another acquisition or of a, a property or or something else or or make uh, have quick access to funds at still very low rates because it's backed by real estate. That's product, a product we're seeing, and we'll do that up up to about sixty five percent loan to value against the value right. of the of the of the building. Would you need an appraisal for that, Oz, um, to to leverage that real estate line of credit? It's funny with real estate with appraisals right now because they're also kind of. Uh, all, all over the place because what is what are what are buildings worth and they're trading so quickly. So we will we still look at it in an income we value buildings on income approach. So when banks look at it, we would say if we if we own this property and we had to lease it out, what kind of income lease income would be would be would we be able to generate? And then we use cap rates, relevant cap rates for the for the area and come up with a value. So 
Uh, most of the time, unless it's our, the deal's already on our books, we will we will ask for an appraisal, and it's really just line up how we're off, we're uh, calculating the value based on the in, lease income. Does that align with the income approach in the appraisal? Right. Okay. Good to know. And given given you know like how much things have changed, um, I know you've. You've outlined some really good uh, pointers here for folks, but um, the first one really struck me as, you know, it, it, it's kind of a natural thing. You would assume this is the case, but it's probably not always the case where the banker doesn't know what the business owner is up to, or perhaps the buyer hasn't even talked to the bank when they're going to look at a business. They just make a bunch of assumptions, but having a good relationship with the bank um, probably can get you a, a pretty... There's a lot of advantages to it at the end of the day. And, and this goes both ways. It's just as much on the banker uh, and as it is on our customers, right? We have to make sure we're checking in on our customers often and regularly to ensure we understand where their where their business is headed and what their needs are. Uh, but the customer does have to trust, they have to trust their banker and build and build on that relationship because then it just becomes easier when there is a need, whether it's a good situation or a bad, the more we understand it, the more the easier it is for, for to help uh, help the customer out. And and because things are uh, because of the pandemic and the COVID impact, there's more due diligence and and analysis required when we're looking at requests right now. So understanding the next point talks about understanding the impact of your business so we have to be able to understand understand every single file we touch we have to be able to understand and explain what the impact was on the business model and the cash flow and so now now so more than ever projections come into play even on the smaller end it used to be we only asked to use stats for projections for the larger companies but now with uh when we look at things and there's a need and 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 it has been a bit, uh, if the income has fluctuated, we need to get good projections to see uh, what the next, you know, next year by quarter would look like. So not just do bankers, make sure you're staying close to your accountants because it should be proactive. These conversations should be proactive and not reactive, right? It makes it that much harder for us to respond quickly when there's either a crunch or an issue or an acquisition coming up. And, and we need, you need to leave us some time and provide us some quality information. So we had quite a few companies that use those interim CFO, interim CFO for hire um, and, and just on a temporary basis got the quality and the information improved enough uh, to, to get the financing in, in a reasonable amount of time. And, and the last point, as I already stated, you know, proactive. So don't wait until last minute. Don't wait until you're overdrawn or about to be overdrawn or about to be in default. Have those conversations regularly as to where things are going and if there's a material impact to the business so we can figure out a solution as partners. Here's here's more of a pointed question, but how how do you typically look at subsidies? Um, cause, cause I know if you have a good accountant, they may find ways to help bring in some extra cash. I mean, how do you guys look at that from a banking perspective? Yeah. So subsidies and any of the, any of those programs were available to everyone, right? Anyone that qualified and, and they took them and, and not all businesses needed them, but it was available and they took it. So we 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 take two two approaches so if what would have been what was the COVID impact to come back to the base of what was the COVID impact to the cash flow and and usually obviously there's a top line impact and margins and then so impact overall cash flow the subsidies we don't ignore them we don't just back them out as if they didn't happen because that was real cash that came in but now where's the business headed going forward so it has that has that revenue bounce back is their cash flow re 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 returning now and what does that normalized look like so it's not that we just uh ignore those because the subsidies wouldn't have been required if there wasn't a pandemic right so they're there for a reason so it's not uh it's not viewed negatively by the bank if a, if a company qualified for a subsidy and, and took it right 
No, it's a good response. I think we look at it, you know, very similarly. I mean, you know, there's some companies who didn't necessarily need it, but qualified and, and received it and their business is still humming along and it made profit look even better. Um, we'd probably look at that as more of a one-off. And then there's other situations where, you know, they did need it and it covered a gap. And, you know, moving forward, it looks like, you know, they've gotten back to pre-pandemic levels. So, yeah, it's hard to ignore it from a valuation perspective because there's a reason for it too. So it's it's almost a case by case on our end, but we're always yeah. curious to see how the bank looks at it. Because, I mean, just, just backing it out in every circumstance doesn't make sense either. No, I mean, you'd be, you'd be offside on the majority of your covenant. That's right. <laughs> and the customers are going to be, well, I wouldn't have needed the subsidy. If I didn't lose all, all my revenue for, for those months. <laughs> that's exactly. And that's, that's the discussion we typically have. The seller will say it should be included and they build good cases to, uh, to convince you to keep it in there. And the buyers of course say, Oh, it's gotta be a one-off. We're never going to see this again. So that's, that's right. the, the fun conversations I guess we get to have. Yeah. Not just looking backward. Now it's more, you know, we used to be the banks were always looking backwards and they want to see that stability and that recurring cash flow. But now it's the looking forward is is just as important because now you're seeing, okay, things are bouncing back, but where, what does your cash flow look like? And that's where the projection piece comes into play. Uh, and and having that closer connection to your accountants and your CFOs and and being able to put together quality projections. So here's where things are today, and here's where the they look like they're headed in the next 12 months. Right. That's great. Oz, I appreciate uh, you taking the time today. If folks are looking for more information, what's the best way uh, for them to find you? Yeah, so on this slide, you've got my contact information, my email and and my my phone number there, my cell phone. So that's, uh, that's the easiest way to contact me, even if it is, if your listeners are uh, are looking at an acquisition or a company that needs financing that's outside of Halton or Hamilton and it's in GTA. If we can't do it, I'll refer it to one of my counterparts that are co- that cover that area. So it just depends on the relationship and where it's coming from and where it makes the most sense. So it, a lot of times, just because we're sitting in Halton doesn't mean we're only doing deals in Halton. Our deals are all across the GTA. So it is based on uh, where the client is situated and where they want to be dealing. Uh, if they want to be dealing, if they like, if the deal is in Toronto and they would deal with a Toronto banker, I can, I will refer to my counterpart there. Right on. Perfect. Thanks, Oz. Looking forward to doing this again. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. It was great, great getting a chance to speak to you and, and, uh, and the listeners on, on the call here and, and appreciate the invite. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is great.